Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon from Athens. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, dear Secretary General, dear President of the Parliamentary Assembly, dear Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, dear President of the European Court of Human Rights, dear Chairs of Committees and Institutions of the Council of Europe, dear Mr. Sicilianos, uh, dear Mrs. Mbakoyani, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I would like to thank you, first of all, for accepting the invitation of the Greek Chairmanship to hold uh, this discussion. I would also like to welcome everyone connected with us online, starting uh, with the permanent representatives of the member states in Strasbourg. Ladies and gentlemen, following the situation created by COVID-19 pandemic, it became apparent that we need to put on the table the big question that is placed before us. The impact of the sanitary crisis on our democracy and our fundamental freedoms. The question opens a great debate. Finding the right answers is indeed a challenge. And like all major challenges, needs a comprehensive response. The best place to hold this debate is actually the Council of Europe. The sensitivity displayed by the institutions of the Council of Europe against these commanding challenges has been both timely and focused. And I may also say inspiring. I am referring to the guidelines to member states by the Secretary General and the clear positions adopted by all institutions of the Council. I follow it each and every one of them very carefully. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, I'm standing a few steps from the Acropolis, an eternal symbol of democracy and free expression. Another pandemic 2,400 years ago caused in this city the, how, the chaos and massive loss of life. That pandemic, claimed the lives of one third of the population of Athens and marked the end of the, an era. So we have an excellent example on how a sanitary crisis can affect democracy. Public health and democracy are both at a distinct position in our pyramid of values and in our longstanding European political, cultural, social, and legal tradition. But during the crisis, we have a decision to make, and we decided to place human life above everything else and to safeguard decent living for the elderly. As Ministry of Health spokesman for the pandemic, the Greek uh, professor, Mr. Tsiodras, uh, that spoke to us uh, on a teleconference on Monday, he stressed the greatest achievement of modern medicine and said that this extension of life was exactly what the COVID-19 threatened. In order to protect public health as a human right, we were compelled to impose restrictions on a series of fundamental rights, as you rightly point out, dear Commissioner for Human Rights. These restrictions varied both in intensity and in their objective. Some of them apply directly on those infected, such as confinement. Others were meant to contain the spreading of the virus and were imposed to those not infected by social distancing. In the same spirit, free movement was restricted along with other freedoms and rights, namely access to justice, or economic activity in order to protect human life and public health. As we were watching the empty streets of our cities, we knew that this was being done for the right reasons. We did it to save human lives, but we also knew that there were certain red lines that should not be crossed. The principles and values lying at the core of the Council of Europe are the ones that have been guiding us in difficult times, democracy, rule of law, respect for human rights. 
These are the valuable seal that the system of European Convention of Human Rights provide to us and to our democratic institutions for more than 70 years now. The sanitary crisis was not only a threat to human life, but also a threat to our democracy. Very soon, serious questions started to emerge. Did our fellow citizens belonging to vulnerable groups have the special attention they deserve? What about the underprivileged children? What about those students who do not have access to digital technology? When the time comes for election, how can the will of the electoral body be freely and democratically expressed? How can this fundamental right of the citizens be safeguarded? These and many more, I believe, are some of the critical questions that we as politicians all across Europe need to focus on with a sense of responsibility towards European citizens. Especially if we take into account that European citizens accepted these restriction measures in a mature and a very disciplined way. One might say that all happened quite easily. This could induce the thought that it would be easy to impose restrictions because people in their own set of values give priority to health rather to freedom. Or in other words, that the people when driven by fear can be easily subjected to limitations in their fundamental freedoms without serious reactions. This would be unacceptable. The fact that certain hard measures were accepted by the people due to the fear of the disease cannot, in any circumstances, justify restrictions or certain fundamental rights and liberties, such as the right of, to free expression. These measures need to be temporary, proportionate, and based on scientific facts that prove their necessity. They also need to be constantly reviewed. This is specified in the Convention and has been repeatedly stressed by all institutions of the Council of Europe. I heard Mr. Dems recently saying that the parliamentary process in the Member States must continue as long as possible in emergency situation. I couldn't agree more. In Greece, we kept the parliament functioning all through the difficult times of the pandemic. The committees kept working and all the measures applied against COVID-19 were adopted by the parliament. At the same time, presenting the truth to the public in clear and honest terms and without leaving space for fake news helped significantly in building a relation of trust with the people. It is also thanks to, the relation of, to this relation of trust that we can say today that we managed to contain the spread of the virus and flatten the curve. Dear friends, as we all know, this situation is far from over. Much has been said on the economic consequences and the impact on the labor market. We also have to pay attention on the greater social and human consequences. The ministerial session in Athens on November 4th should be an opportunity for the Committee of Ministers to adopt a set of principles on pandemic in a form of a declaration. I'm thinking, for example, of those relating to social rights, health, justice, education, the media, to name a few. In this context, the chairmanship will support your initiative, dear Secretary General, to promote intergovernmental cooperation. I would like to close my intervention by recalling that the COVID-19 crisis is not the only crisis that we should take our consideration. The climate emergency is another major challenge for our societies and the Council of Europe must rise to the occasion. Following on the initiatives of the Georgian chairmanship, the Greek chairmanship has maintained the priority on human rights and the environment. And I hope that the initiatives on this matter will be soon launched. Dear friends, you may have, we may have national borders to separate us. And we may have chosen to close them down temporarily in order to protect human life and the public health. But this does not mean in any way that we lack the spirit of understanding the, or solidarity towards each other. We need to care about those who left us and their families 
and those who suffered in an intensive care unit away from their families until they were cured. At the same time, we need to care about the blows inflicted in our democratic values by the pandemic. We have to do anything in our power so that freedom and democracy prevail and human rights and the rule of law be respected. This is why we believe that by discussing how this issue was dealt with in every country and by sharing good practices, we will be able to produce a set of principles on which we can rely. These principles will serve as a map for all us all, citizens, organizations, governments. So that if ever have to face this situation again, during our generation or sometime in the future, we will not have to go through an uncharted territory as we do now. We will be prepared. Our children will be prepared. We owe this to the next generation, to the generation E, the generation of Europe. These principles need to combine the respect for life and public health with the respect of democracy, rule of law, and human rights. Combination which I believe is accurately presented in the history of this city, both ancient, but also in the modern times. We are looking forward to welcoming you in Athens, so we can make an important step by adopting a declaration based on these principles, a declaration that will open a new page, a new chapter in the book of human rights protection. I strongly believe that in this manner, we can give a whole new meaning and a significant added value to the celebration of the 70 years of the, human, uh, of the European Convention on Human Rights. I would like uh, to thank you for your attention, and I would like to give the floor to the Secretary General of the Council of Europe for her intervention. Dear Secretary General, Yes. Do you yes. hear me? Yes. Uh, alors, bonjour à toutes et à tous, uh, Monsieur le Ministre, uh, chers uh, collègues, uh, le Conseil de l'Europe aide ses États membres à protéger et à promouvoir les droits de l'homme, la démocratie et l'état de droit, quelles que soient les circonstances et à tout moment. Et assurément, aujourd'hui, les circonstances sont particulièrement difficiles. Il existe au sein de notre organisation une volonté ardente de soutenir les autorités nationales afin de mieux faire face aux répercussions de la pandémie de COVID-19 conformément à nos normes juridiques communes. La manière dont nos agents ont adopté leur méthode de travail et réorienté leurs activités en est la preuve. En avril, j'ai publié des lignes directrices pour aider nos États membres à trouver un juste équilibre dans la définition de leur réponse à l'urgence. Cette boîte à outils a été conçue pour contribuer à ce que les mesures prises par les autorités soient proportionnées à la menace que pose le virus est limitée dans le temps. Et elle s'appuie elle sur un large avant éventail de travaux. Nos organes se sont entretenus avec des experts. Ils ont organisé des événements en ligne et publié des mises à jour, des déclarations et des informations pour aider les autorités nationales à lutter contre les effets du coronavirus. Les domaines couverts par ces travaux comprennent, entre autres, la protection de la santé en vertu de la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme, de la Charte sociale euh, euh, européenne et de la Convention d'Oveido, la liberté d'expression et d'information et la liberté de la presse, la protection des données et la cybercriminalité, l'antidiscrimination, euh, la diversité et l'inclusion, la prévention du racisme et d'intolérance, la prévention de la traite des êtres humains, les droits des enfants 
et la protection des enfants contre l'exploitation sexuelle et les abus sexuels, et des questions relatives aux langues minoritaires au regard de la multiplication des politiques dans le contexte actuel. Stepping back, it's fair to say that some specific challenges stand out across Europe as a whole. For example, the rights to help and equitable access to healthcare have come under strain as some health systems have proven unprepared. And vulnerable groups experience particularly grave consequences where the provision of healthcare is inadequate. These groups include the gravely ill people in extreme hardship, the elderly, and those deprived of their liberty, including migrants. Related to this, social rights are threatened as incomes fall, unemployment goes up, and recession bites with a disproportionate impact on some parts of the workforce, force, including women. Women have also been exposed to a high risk of abuse in their homes, given lockdown restrictions. We have published a resource web page to help national administrations tackle this. And the president of Grevio had, has noted that many national administrations are rising to the challenge. But the increased use of instant messages uh, to aid organizations is evidence of the fear that many women are living with. I have been clear about the need to address this, just as I have warned that member states must ensure that the pandemic does not lead to a weakening of the democratic foundations on which our civil and political rights and all our freedoms rely. Is there more that we should do? It is important to hear your views, because for our response to be as effective as possible, we rely on your insights. And as we move forward in this fluid situation, it is vital that we continue to learn from one another's experience and use that knowledge to guide our next steps. So the decision of the Greek chairmanship to organize this meeting and to prioritize the Council of Europe's response to the pandemic is greatly welcome. I look forward to seeing the political declaration intended for Athens in November taking shape. And I hope that the process leading to the preparation of its principles will unite all parts of our organization. This would be a fine way to mark the 70th anniversary of the European Convention on Human Rights, which also united so many across our continent. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Secretary General. Uh, now I would like to pass the floor to Rick Dames, the President of the Parliamentary Assembly. Rick. Thank you very much uh, for having us. I think it is uh, great uh, to have this meeting in order to share some experiences and, send, and some views on the report or the declaration or the decisions we will be taking in the Athens Ministerial. I'm very fond of uh, the fact that you have decided as a Greek uh, presidency to have a set of principles put in a political declaration uh, at the end of your presidency. Uh, maybe a few elements I would like to uh, bring into this debate. First of all, it's all about values, it's all about fundamental freedoms. And as I get it, basically what we are addressing is what about democracy and human rights during a pandemic crisis or any big crisis? I would like to add an element, which is not only during the crisis, but what about after the crisis, right? So what we see is that a lot of countries are taking measures that we should be aware that in some cases it might be that governments, executive powers, what have you, will try to keep some of these restrictions in place for political reasons. So uh, one element so that I would like to bring into this debate is that when addressing human rights democracy during the crisis and setting out some principles, I think also to a certain extent we should address how about after the crisis returning to normal, not accepting the abnormal, returning to normal and having our values, fundamental freedoms, the rights 
100% in place. It's the first thing that I would like to mention in this meeting. Second one, I think what is also very important to address in, in, in a declaration is the fact that we are a multilateral organization. So this is about doing something together and doing something alone. What we've seen is that a number of countries have tried to cope with this crisis very unexpected in a very singular way, like getting back to themselves. I think that was not always right. I think that we should have over the border consultation. I think we should try to do things a little bit parallel in the same way. So the report that you will make, the guidelines, the principles, to, in my view, also have to address multilateralism as opposed to nationalism and extremism. But let's be fair, what is going to happen once the measures go down, politically speaking, I suspect that extremism, nationalism are going to try to grasp the concept of freedom and to build on that, wrongfully so. So multilateralism, again, as opposed to nationalism and extremism, in my feeling, in my view, also might be an element to be addressed in these principles. The third one, obviously, and this is about the parliamentary assembly, how do parliaments cope with this? As you rightfully, Chair, said in the beginning, uh, we believe that parliaments should stay on deck at all times. From an organizational point of view, it might be not easy, but basically the citizens' trust is given to a parliament and then a parliament gives their trust by majority to an executive power. So the parliament needs to stay on deck. So in these principles, it would be important, in my view, that we set out some elements and we can help you with that from, from the parliament assembly as how do parliaments stay on deck. Secondly, what is the relationship between a parliament and the executive power during a crisis? Why is that? Because we know that it is the executive who needs to put in place certain measures, but it needs the legal basis, and this is the parliament who needs to adopt it. Many countries have given from the parliament executive legal powers, if you wish, to the executive, of course, to be approved afterwards back in the parliaments, but this relationship between parliament and executive also is a domain that we need to, I believe, address from a point of view of what would be the red lines not to cross in terms of this relationship, what would be the red lines not to cross in terms of diminishing the power of the parliament and basically diminishing the power of the people who, again, have given their power into a parliament. Now, as far as the parliament assembly is concerned, what are we doing now? We are preparing five reports and they can be added uh, as, a, as an additional information, as a substance to to the declaration of the principles you will be working on uh, from the chairmanship. The five reports are on legal, with an opinion of the Cultural Committee on Media. So legal is basically the court rule of law. Political committee will have a report. This is basically on what should the parliament be able to do? What is the relationship between the parliament and the executive? What about multilateralism as opposed to nationalism and extremism? Third one is the social committee. That report is already done, so we will share that with you. Of course, it needs to be adopted in the standing committee. That addresses more the health issue. The fourth report is on migration and refugees. What about these people during a crisis? And then the fifth one is about equality and the rights of women also during this crisis. But then again, these five reports will address the issue from a point of view. What about red lines principles during the crisis? But also what about once the crisis is done? So we need to be sure that our values, our fundamental freedoms on these five topics stay, remain 100% intact. We know life will be different, but the values and principles should remain. The second initiative that we have taken is we send out on the basis of the toolkit, excellent toolkit, by the way, from the Secretary General, we send out some kind of a, an information to the 47 presidents of parliaments, of course, not to the, to the executives, because that's not our counterpart, but the 47 parliament's chairs got from us a message asking to have a debate on the floor in their parliaments about all these important topics. I can tell you that already today, we've got Georgia, we've got probably Italy, we've got Greece, one of the first, obviously. Uh, we probably will have France, Belgium is done. The Netherlands will be on board tomorrow, Germany. Uh, we try to have Iceland, Turkey. In the coming weeks to come, to have these debates on one or more of these elements in the national parliament itself in order to link up the national parliament to the multilateral aspect of the council of europe and i think chair you're absolutely right this is something we need to address together you cannot address it alone so that is the second initiative that we've taken 
And of course, we will feed that in uh, into your endeavor in order to, to the substance, provide with elements that you can use. And I hope and I'm sure that we will deliberate on that together to, to, to try to feed into what would be these red lines, what will be these principles to basically adhere to during a crisis. But again, what about after the crisis, protecting 100% values and fundamental freedoms? Maybe one last remark uh, I would like to make. Thank you for mentioning the environment. It has been quite peculiar in the sense that it's never happened before. So I've been told that the same priority is carried over uh, through different presidencies of the Committee of Ministers. The linkage between environment and human rights is important. We will start working on that in the near future. I hope that we can do that under the form of a trialogue. We've done it before uh, and it worked very well. So I do hope that this issue also will be on board because this is also something we should look at as an opportunity. Everyone has seen what happened during the pandemic in concerning nature and other issues. I think the public, the citizen is more sensitive to it now. And so to a certain extent, a decent, clean, healthy environment is a basic human right. So linking both uh, and also maybe putting it to a certain extent into the principles that you are working on for the November ministerial conference, I think that will be very important. Voila, this would be a number of elements that I would like to put on the table in this meeting. Once again, I would really like to thank you for having this initiative. It's very important that we can share our experience, that we can put our views uh, uh, on the table. Et pour finir, à toutes et à tous, une belle journée. Je sais bien que je vous ai adressé en anglais tout le temps, mais je voulais pas provoquer des problèmes avec les interprètes. Et donc, je vous souhaite encore une fois, encore une belle journée uh, après uh, ce, notre réunion. Et un grand salut de, de, de l'Assemblée parlementaire depuis Strasbourg. Un grand merci pour avoir cette réunion. Je pense qu'il y a beaucoup de valeur là-dedans. Merci et à bientôt. Euh, merci beaucoup, cher Président, pour euh, votre euh, intervention. Euh, je, je reste sur le trilogue que vous avez déjà proposé et je pense qu'on peut faire en forme de trilogue avant de d'adaptation à cette déclaration. Alors, euh, on y va à, au président de la, euh, de la Cour des de, de droits humains. Euh, euh, monsieur le président, euh, dear Spano, euh, dear Mr. Robert Spano, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. And uh, I would like also to congratulate you for your election. And I want to express, as I, I sent to you to the letter that I've sent to you, that uh, as I said, uh, uh, to express our confidence in your institutions, and we are looking forward for a fruitful uh, period in the European Court of Human Rights. Thank you, thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much indeed for uh, organizing this uh, session, and also for your kind words now at the outset. It is a great pleasure for me to be here with you today, along with uh, my predecessor, President Sicilianos, and the Registrar of the Court, Roderick Little. Um, I want to contribute uh, at the outset with first a general point uh, about the nature and scope of the pandemic and what I perceive to be the consequences for the Council of Europe, and then perhaps move on to elaborate briefly on a few ways in which I think the pandemic may potentially impact the convention system and maybe contribute at the end with some general elements, some general principles that perhaps may be of use for the preparation of the ministerial session in Athens in November. Now, first, my general point, uh, which is this. This pandemic is not only a crisis in the sanitary sense. It is, I think, and I think it would be useful for us in our deliberations to bear in mind, as some have already said, that for the further development of European democracy, the rule of law, and for the protection of human rights, the pandemic also constitutes a challenge, a crisis that we meet, need to take very seriously. Interestingly, the crisis has brought our peoples back to first principles. People are appreciating, again, the need for solidarity in our communities to the importance of social safety nets, in particular for our younger generation, which I know is an element very important for the Greek presidency, a stable and secure employment situation, and also to the realization 
of the importance of family life. The Council of Europe and the Convention system with the European Court of Human Rights as the adjudicatory body, we may not be on the front line in any sanitary sense, but we are certainly on the front line in safeguarding and promoting the rights and values embedded within the Council of Europe structure and the European Convention on Human Rights. I would argue, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, that never before has the Council of Europe and what this organization of 47 member states stands for been as important as now and in the months and years to come. It is a great challenge that we are confronted with and it is extremely important and echoing uh, the, the, the comments made by the president of the PACE, the parliamentary assembly, now unitary unity of purpose and us speaking with a collective voice becomes ever more important. Let me elaborate on this. What does this require for, for, from all of us at the general level of policy and law? It requires that the external message of the Council of Europe, its standard setting work, and the work of the European Court of Human Rights incentivizes and triggers us to try not only as a singular entity, but as a collective entity of states with common values that we intend to secure and safeguard, attempt to find common ground in the way we move forward. The pandemic certainly puts pressure on member states to fulfill their positive obligations to protect life. But the collective voice must be found to galvanize and counter the risks of the pandemic being utilized as a pretext for abusing public power imposing measures on the populace which, although intuitively persuasive in the face of an unprecedented threat to human life and well-being, is upon a closer look potentially manifestly disproportionate and an overreach for fundamental rights and freedoms. Balance is key and balance is essential. Let me then move on to my second part. I want to identify and distill four principles four general and fundamental principles, which I think will be manifested in the convention-based challenges to the measures applied by states countering this threat. But I think principles which might be kept in mind in the upcoming work of the Greek presidency. And to some extent, I want to echo what was just said by President of the Parliamentary Assembly, Rick Dems. Some of the elements I mentioned, we, I will come back to as well. The first principle, the public interest, whilst undoubtedly important, cannot be an absolute trump card for national authorities in the fight against the pandemic. The convention requires proportionality, a balance to be struck between the public interest and the autonomy of the person. The responsibility for striking that balance is at the outset for the national authorities. That is clear. But in short, the convention requires all national authorities, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches to engage with the pr principle of proportionality in good faith. Second principle, the principle of legality. It is based on the primordial principle of the rule of law that permeates the convention. This principle will become ever salient, ever more important when lockdowns, restrictions on freedom of movement, and other such measures are imposed. The principle of legality requires that measures taken at national level are accessible and foreseeable. This precludes vague and overbroad rules that run the risk of unpredictability and arbitrariness in their enforcement. Third principle, and here I come back to which I wholeheartedly agree with the president of the PACE. Rules adopted at national level as a basis for pandemic-related measures restricting individual rights must, must not afford excessive discretion to the executive. In a true democracy, the executive must not be the sole arbiter of what rules are applicable. The democratically elected, elected legislator must be reacted and up to the task of engaging with the difficult balancing of interests required in this field. I do hope that the Parliamentary Assembly will be at the forefront of disseminating to the member states
principles to parliaments in how they should deal with actualizing, operationalizing the legislative will into the norms applicable in this field. My final principle, which I think we need to, we need to take account of is that the adoption of emergency laws or declarations deviating in general from convention guarantees must be strictly tailored to meet the exigencies of the situation. As I speak, 10 member states have derogated from the convention under Article 15 of the convention. So let's be clear, emergency laws must not become the new norm. This is a crucial element in the message moving forward. The pandemic may well alter our lives, may well change our lives, but the Council of Europe should be at the forefront in making clear that it must not eradicate the system of fundamental values which forms the cornerstone of the Council of Europe and the European Convention on Human Rights. Thank you very much, Minister. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, President. Uh, I think that uh, both, all four uh, items that you, you presented in your intervention, proportionality, legality, excessive uh, discretion to executive and emergency laws should not become the new normality, are all uh, defining what is uh, going to be our work from now on, how to define these basic values and how to put uh, certain elements limiting exactly uh, the powers of the executive over uh, the extreme case uh, situation. And I would like to go to the Commissioner of uh, Human Rights for her intervention. Uh, I would like to welcome you in our discussion, dear Duncha, and you have the floor. Well, we can't hear you. You have to open. Uh, you have to open the microphone. Yeah. No. Okay. No, you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman, Secretary General, President of the Parliamentary Assembly, President of the Court, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. I'm very happy to uh, join you in this uh, exchange of views. Um, I must say that I would be much happier to be present in Athens, uh, but even seeing you in cyberspace and seeing this magnificent scene uh, behind chairmans, uh, um, it's, it's something that gives me hope uh, that we will meet in November and that we are moving in a, in a good direction. Now, uh, I would like to offer some thoughts and some recommendations. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been the deadliest event uh, since Second World War for many of our member states. Uh, like 9-11 and the 2008 uh, financial crisis before it, uh, the pandemic deeply shocked our societies and led to a series of measures that are taking a huge toll on people's lives. I therefore see uh, today's meeting uh, as a crucial one to develop a renewed commitment to making our societies more resilient, not only to this pandemic, but also to future shocks. Uh, what is at stake uh, indeed is the type of society we want to live in and pass it to uh, the next generations. The choices we are making now uh, in the middle of the pandemic and the ones that we will make in the future will determine whether we strengthen our freedoms uh, or relinquish them, um, promote participation or undermine democracy, empower people or marginalize them. I see in particular uh, three lessons that we can draw uh, from the pandemic and that should inspire our response in a way. The first is that we need more equality. Uh, indeed, we have not all been equal in the face of the pandemic. Those who were poor uh, before it became poorer. Those who were disadvantaged faced even greater disadvantages. The case of older persons is emblematic, and it was already mentioned by the Secretary General. In many of our member states, they have paid the highest toll, not only for the health vulnerabilities associated with age, but also for the social settings in which many of them are kept. 
those living independently uh, also suffered because of the lockdown measures um, that further isolate, isolated them from their families uh, and the rest of the community. Although uh, different problems have been affecting uh, different groups of people, such as persons with disabilities, uh, women, children, Roma, detainees, migrants, LGBTI people and media professionals, they all share a common denominator. Their rights were not fully implemented before the pandemic. And this is one of the reasons we are facing even greater problems now during this pandemic. And this needs to be recognized by all. If these people's rights had not been neglected in the past, the pandemic would probably have taken a less dreadful toll, and we would face a less daunting task today. The second lesson is that we can no longer procrastinate in realizing human rights for all. We need a renewed impetus now. The many challenges that our societies will have to face require that we strengthen the place uh, human rights occupy in uh, our societies, starting by giving a more central focus to equal enjoyment of social and economic rights and equal access to healthcare and education. There is no easy fix, but already taking the decisions uh, to address the long-standing shortcomings together is a good start. This is my hope for uh, this exchange of views and the next meeting, that we decide to use the Council of Europe as a strategic tool to move forward together and reinforce human rights. And here I see the third lesson of the pandemic, and this is something that has been mentioned by all speakers before me, uh, but particularly elaborated by President uh, of the Parliamentary Assembly and President of the Court, and that is the need for strengthen multilateralism. No country can solve alone the complex human rights challenges that this health crisis poses, nor those that will come uh, with future crises. Our organization stems from the vision of leaders uh, who were standing over the ashes of the Second World War, understood the, that multilateral cooperation is the best tool to try to solve common problems. It is now our turn to give renewed impetus to the ambition of realizing human rights and facilitating the economic and social progress of our societies. The pandemic has dealt um, a severe blow to millions of people uh, in Europe. They now really look to us, to the Council of Europe and all the tools we have at our disposal to fulfill their needs and rights. And as your Commissioner for Human Rights, my message would be that we cannot simply betray these expectations, and I'm sure this will not be the case. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Definitely common action uh, is needed uh, towards common problems. And uh, I would like to ask now the President of the Local and Regional Authorities, Anders Knape, uh, to tell us what is going on at the local level, because, uh, okay, we need a uh, transnational response, but also local authorities should, pay, should play a role on how to deal with these difficult situations. Anders, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to speak to you in this important meeting on behalf of the Congress in Strasbourg. First of all, I want to say that we have, as a consequence of the situation, of course, as all others, cancelled all the, all the, the meeting on the spot. We have had um, a lot of video conferences and, and other meetings, and we are very grateful for the facilities that the Council of Europe has organized so we could keep contact with the local and regional representatives all over Europe during this crisis. That has been a very good help. And we have also very strongly supported uh, the statements and um, guidance from the Secretary General of the Council of Europe um, to, to be sure that we could fulfill the work even during these very difficult times. Um, 
we can say that um, uh, the situation is, as you all know, uh, very special for 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 all for all uh, institutions all over Europe. But what we can see very clearly is that a lot of the things that are delivered at the moment to the citizens when it comes to healthcare, elderly care, uh, testing, all sort of or, or, or measures taken is is done by local and regional authorities all over Europe. And I think it's very important to, to remember that also when we, we discuss the future. And um, we have collecting now, and we are working with collecting good examples, experience from what is done uh, from, from our uh, local and regional authorities all over Europe, that we could use this in, in the future when we are going to discuss what was going, what was well done, what, what could we have done in a better way, uh, what were mistakes was done, and so on, to guide uh, for, for the future. Um, we have also launched a web platform um, showcasing uh, activities and good practice that uh, all local authorities around Europe can take care of. And I have also had a lot of meetings with representatives uh, uh, around in Europe, um, for example, the mayor of Istanbul and other, uh, other persons who are in charge of, of the work in, in Europe. And uh, what we can see, I can give you two examples that um, we, are, we are very concerned about. And that's, for example, that we have received very uh, quite uh, worrying information from third resources on the continuation of suspensions of mayors in the southeast of Turkey and the ongoing undermining of local self-government in the country during the pandemic. And I decide to issue a statement and call for an end of this situation. We have also received information from the Latvian Association of Local and Regional Governments regarding worrying developments of the current territorial reform, particularly in the light of the continued COVID-19 crisis. And the president of the Chamber of Local Authorities issued a statement to call for suspension of the territorial reform in the country to allow for proper consultation. Um, in what, what's in front of us now is that we are planning to, to hold thematic debates in September. And we, we hope that we can have the autumn session in October. But questions related to the function of local and regional democracy in times of crisis will be discussed, such as the postponement of local elections. We have seen a lot of local and regional elections has been postponed, uh, and that has uh, led to the situation that we have asked for, 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 for nominations of new members for the new term of the Congress to be postponed to the end of this year, so we can take on account of the, 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 the local elections and regional elections that not has been held. The management of temporary changes of distribution of competences, because we know there is in, in some countries a debate now that um, uh, the local and regional authorities can't deliver or are not deliver enough. The, the, the national level have to take all of these responsibilities and of course, we have to work together, local, regional, uh, and national responsibilities. But after the crisis, after we are going out, has gone out of this crisis, I think we have shown during these years that when we have a, a normal situation, local and regional authorities can handle situations and can deliver uh, to, to, the, to the citizens. Uh, we will also discuss the trend of additional responsibilities to the municipalities without the necessary means, and the general application of the principle of local and regional self-government, among others. Our monitoring governance and current affairs committees in particular will respectively discuss safeguarding the European Charter of Local Self-Government in extreme crisis situations, the COVID-19 pandemic and challenges for multi-level governance, and protecting minorities in cities and regions in time of fundamental crisis. These debates will also involve the Congress youth delegate and international experts. And these results will also be reflected in the Congress priorities for 2021 to 2026. 
they will be the basis for the contribution of the Congress to the work of the Council of Europe on the lesson learned and to helping to build resilient societies in the post-COVID-19 period. In the fight against the COVID-19 academy, local and regional authorities found themselves at the front line. And I, I can say, in my capacity as president of the Swedish Association of Local and Regional Authorities, I have daily wide video conference and meetings with ministers on the role of local and regional authorities in the health sector, social service, public transport, schooling, um, enterprises, and non-profit sector, to name a few. Local and regional authorities are providing the operational share, but also a large part of the financial share of the burdens. They will also be key actors in bolstering the economic recovery and social revival of the member states. The priority in the coming months for all levels of government will be to join forces in order to overcome the crisis, help citizens and prepare for the COVID-19 aftermath. And we stand ready to actively participate in the upcoming work of the Committee of Ministers in the respect and to bring his contribution to the Minister's session in Athens in November. And we are very grateful to having the opportunity to participate as a voice of local and regional authorities all over Europe in the Council of Europe. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. It's uh, it's uh, very important that you you have uh, pointed out uh, the issue of uh, postponement of uh, local uh, authorities' election, which is one of the major issues that we have to deal with, and also the the incidence of uh, the uh, the pandemic being an excuse in order to intervene in the local authorities in uh, some uh, member states something that uh, should be, uh, by all means, unacceptable. Uh, now I would like to ask the voice of the I, uh, INGOs, uh, Ms. Anna Rurka, the president of the conference of the INGOs, to, to take the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, dear Secretary General, dear Presidents, uh, dear Commissioner, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to sincerely thank Greek chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers for organizing this exchange of views and ensuring the video transmission, making this discussion accessible to the general public. The pandemic has amplified existing inequalities. Vulnerable people and elderly people have become even more vulnerable due to a lack of access to services and rights. Despite the extraordinary efforts of some government to, for example, temporarily regular, regularize all migrants so that they can have access to help. Victim of domestic violence, children at risk, victim of gender-based or racial or ethnic discrimination, person with disabilities, undocumented migrants, person living in poverty, youth and adults, homeless people, Roma, some deprived of liberty, but also human rights defenders themselves are, according to our members, the most vulnerable groups affected by the phenomena that have increased during the pandemic. The risk faced during the pandemic has provoked a trauma which will have long lasting consequences, particularly with regards to mental health, civil rights and social and economic concern. However, the health issue were quickly joined by economic concern and questions remain on what changes this pandemic will bring to our societies. Will we come back to business as usual or as soon as possible? Or could this crisis bring changes in laws, public policy and practices to implement fully human rights, democracy and rule of law and protect the most vulnerable and to feel stronger together? Definitely, a healthy democracy based on human rights and rule of law is also good for, for our health. The pandemic brought a new dynamic to the exercise of representative and participatory democracy. The government assumed an exceptional power in several states during the pandemic. Even society organizations and NGOs under lockdown have had to limit their physical presence in the field, but have quickly adopted to the condition by using the digital space for the monitoring or assistance. 
If we take an overall picture of the situation, we see that civil society is a key partner in helping states to frame inclusive policies and provide social support to vulnerable communities. They should be recognized not only as charities, but also as democratic actors and partners. Let me present now some uh, recommendations that were uh, formulated by our members. We observe some good practices respecting standards on civil participation in decision making. However, the, these are fairly isolated cases initiated by local government or MPs. In a more general way, civil society organization and the public at large have rarely been consulted in the process of designing, implementing or reviewing appropriate measures. Public participation, especially for CSO, cannot be restricted at the time when they are a partner in responding of, to emergency. There is also a strong need, need to create platforms allowing for a two-way communication among individuals, government, local authorities, non-governmental organization, and private sector in order to inform about the initiative and to identify the condition of social vulnerability. In times of health emergency, evidence-based decision-making and transparency are crucial. The decision makers should provide local government, the relevant private sector actors, and NGOs and civil society with access to open data um, on the social vulnerability and the risk faced by citizens. Such solution can empower citizens by giving visibility to their concerns, better enabling them to join or influence the governance process and facilitating the access to the information needed and to create a grassroots solution. COVID-19 should not be used as an excuse to violate the fundamental rights. We recommend reinforcing the ratification and implementation of the European Social Charter and in collective complaint procedure in order that people living on the margin of society, including migrants, can benefit from this right. This is a need. There is a need to provide good working condition and access to appropriate equipment for all professionals who remain on the front line. Our expectations are that our government, together with local authorities, helped by the general public, take more targeted action to protect all vulnerable groups within society. Regarding the elderly person, there is a need to change our approach and behavior. We need to fight against ages. The emergency measures should be proportionated and limited in time. These measures should not be have a discriminatory impact. Access to the internet should be declared by all member states as a fundamental right. Finally, European leaders should be ambitious and build Europe on social and climate justice, fighting human rights, rule of law, and democracy in the center. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we think as well. I, I, I think that it's going to be uh, you open a, a debate for the ratification of the European Social Charter, and I think uh, Mr. Palmisano uh, is going to to take the lead from you. But uh, first, I would like to go to the president of the Venice Commission, uh, Mr. Gianni uh, Bucciccio. Uh, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur. Mesdames et Messieurs, les guerres, les catastrophes naturelles et les épidémies ont toujours existé sur notre terre bien avant la peste d'Athènes de, de l'an 430 avant Jésus-Christ, à laquelle vous avez fait référence. La Commission de Venise traite de la question de l'état d'urgence depuis longtemps. Elle avait préparé en 1995 une étude, un manuel sur l'état d'urgence. Ensuite, sa doctrine en la matière s'est enrichie grâce à de, de nombreux avis qui ont été demandés par les États membres sur des questions spécifiques euh, lié à cette question. Le Covid aujourd'hui euh, représente une situation inédite. Nous ne l'avons pas connue avant par son ampleur et ses conséquences sanitaires, euh, sociales, économiques. Ceci est probablement dû, a été probablement dû euh, à l'interconnexion croissante euh, des, entre des villes hyper mondialisées. Euh, 
Maintenant, cette épidémie que nous traversons a rendu nécessaire le recours à des pouvoirs et des stratégies d'urgence et nos États doivent se montrer très résilients pour éviter que ces pouvoirs d'exception ne nuisent à la démocratie, aux droits fondamentaux et à l'État de droit, pendant et après l'urgence. Pour cela, il est essentiel, en tout premier lieu, que tout État d'urgence respecte les principes identifiés par la Commission de Venise. La nécessité, celles sont justifiables, les mesures susceptibles d'aider l'État à surmonter la situation exceptionnelle. La proportionnalité à laquelle a été fait référence à plusieurs reprises, notamment par le président de la Cour des droits de l'homme. Les mesures d'urgence doivent être en relation raisonnable avec le but légitime de surmonter la crise. Le caractère temporaire. Euh, <coughs> le caractère temporaire, les mesures d'urgence ne doivent rester en vigueur que tant que perdure la situation exceptionnelle. Contrôle parlementaire et judiciaire efficace de la dé déclaration et de la prolongation de l'état d'urgence, euh, la prévisibilité de la législation d'urgence. Les règles de gestion de l'urgence doivent être définies à l'avance, bien à l'avance, par tous les stakeholders et sans précipitation. La coopération loyale entre les institutions de l'État. Ce principe acquiert une importance capitale lorsqu'il y a des modifications dans la distribution des pouvoirs euh, horizontales, par exemple, lorsque le gouvernement donne des pouvoirs accrus à un ministre particulier comme le ministre de la Santé ou le ministre intérieur, et vertical, c'est-à-dire lorsqu'il euh, doit y avoir une répartition entre l'État, les régions et les collectivités locales. Parce que euh, cela doit garantir une action efficace et coordonnée, dès lors l'égalité et l'équité de traitement de tous les citoyens. Les modèles constitutionnels de gestion des états d'urgence dans les pays membres du Conseil d'Europe sont très variés et peuvent tout être considérés comme acceptables à condition qu'ils garantissent le respect de ces principes. La crise a certainement posé des défis spécifiques et elle a également ré révélé des lacunes et des faiblesses dans la législation, mais aussi et surtout dans les critères de choix et les priorités de définition des politiques et des stratégies. L'état d'urgence repose sur la dichotomie normalité-exception. Nous devons certainement nous poser la question de comment retrouver euh, aussi rapidement que possible la première en sortant de la seconde. Mais il est aussi important de faire trésor de l'expérience de la seconde pour être mieux préparé à gérer une nouvelle crise, car malheureusement, je crains qu'elle va se reproduire. Espérons le plus lointain possible. Euh, voici quelques points de réflexion. Le type, les modalités et le fonctionnement des mesures d'urgence doivent être conçus d'avance en temps normaux, mais les mesures d'urgence ne doivent pas devenir la norme. Elles ne doivent pas faire partie des outils qui sont normalement à la disposition de l'exécutif. Si la rapidité d'action indispensable à la gestion de la crise justifie le transfert de compétences du Parlement à l'exécutif, le Parlement ne doit jamais cesser d'exercer ses prérogatives de contrôle, y compris a posteriori, pour donner une légitimité démocratique aux actions de l'exécutif. La justice constitutionnelle et la justice ordinaire doivent continuer d'être exercées de manière indépendante et efficace. Les mesures d'urgence ne doivent pas avoir d'effet permanent. S'il est nécessaire de prolonger ces effets, c'est le Parlement qui doit en prendre la décision. En situation d'urgence, celles les questions strictement nécessaires et étroitement liées à l'urgence doivent être décidées. Il est exclu qu'on prenne d'autres mesures législatives concernant d'autres sujets et encore plus, il est exclu qu'on organise des référendums constitutionnels. En situation d'urgence, la nécessité de contrepas, checks and balances, institutionnel et non institutionnel, est manifeste. L'importance de, de la liberté d'expression et de la presse est accrue et capitale. Nous avons créé euh, très récemment un observatoire pour euh, contrôler la mise en, en, en œuvre des mesures d'urgence et des déclarations d'urgence dans nos différents États membres. Euh, 
et cela va nous fournir euh, une somme de données qui pourront être exploitées euh, pour préciser davantage ces principes et ces critères. Euh, il y a un un point aussi très important, et il a été fait, euh, on a fait référence à ce point, notamment le président de l'Assemblée et le président du Congrès, euh, euh, aux élections. Euh, un, état, un état d'urgence permettra mal l'équité des élections, notamment la possibilité de bénéficier d'une campagne électorale ouverte et équilibrée. Les élections dont, de, devront donc normalement être reportées, sauf si et jusqu'à quand le scrutin puisse être égal, universel, libre, secret et direct, tout en respectant la sécurité des votants, d'une part, et du personnel des, des administrations électorales, d'autre part. Voilà, Monsieur le Président, euh, en concluant, euh, un bilan du fonctionnement des institutions pendant la crise à la lumière des critères pour indiquer les besoins d'une action dans chaque pays. Et je voudrais souligner qu'en temps de crise, le gouvernement s'appuie lourdement sur l'avis des experts, ce qui est rationnel et justifié. Les décisions restent cependant des décisions politiques. Les gouvernements gardent le choix des moyens d'action et doivent choisir ce qui permet de respecter les principes fondamentaux de la démocratie, du, du, des droits de l'homme et de l'état de droit. La dichotomie entre normalité et exception à laquelle j'ai fait référence euh, tout à l'heure, sur laquelle repose l'état d'urgence, n'est pas nécessairement et ne doit pas devenir un synonyme d'une dichotomie entre la lutte active contre le danger et le constitutionnalisme démocratique, ni entre la protection de la santé publique et de l'état de droit. Merci beaucoup. Euh, merci beaucoup, M. Boukiki. Euh, je pense que nous sommes euh, tous d'accord avec vous. C'est un moment pour euh, action politique et décision politique. Euh, C'est parce que, que nous faisons cette discussion maintenant euh, pour prendre cette décision. Alors, je, je, je donne la parole à M. Palmisano, le président des de comités euh, sur la. Uh, sur les droits sociaux. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Barbiziotis. I hope that you can hear me well. So, Minister, Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I, I wish to thank the Greek chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers for organizing this much needed initiative and for giving me the opportunity to make a statement on the sanitary crisis and social rights. I would like to focus my intervention on three points. First, as the COVID-19 crisis painfully revealed, preparedness is all about social rights and therefore about the European Social Charter, which is the major European instrument for the protection of such rights. In fact, pandemic readiness requires a universal health care and well-equipped and resourced resilient, I would say, public health service, health and safety at work, arrangements to ensure protection of the rights of older people, employment security, a minimum income and adequate guarantee of the right to housing, adequately resourced and solid public education and the protection of children. All these requirements are in the social charter and fulfilling them is crucial when confronted with a crisis such as COVID-19. This is why the European Committee of Social Rights has already adopted on the 21st of April a statement of interpretation on the right to protection of health in a time of pandemic, which relates to Article 11 of the Charter. And we have also announced a more general statement on COVID-19 and social rights, which will be ready in the near future. Let me say that while the first statement was essential, as it has explained what does it mean implementing the right to protection of health and giving priority to such right in the event of a pandemic like COVID-19 and during, during the pandemic threat and crisis, the second statement 
will be equally important as it will try to clarify how to properly safeguard many fundamental social rights that are under stress due to the pandemic and in the aftermath of the pandemic due to possible measures taken by states to cope with the pandemic crisis. Second point, but closely related to the first one. The, the outcomes that countries have experienced are not aleatory or random, so to say. They are rather, rather the result of good practice or sometimes less good practice. And people have felt those outcomes directly on their lives. It is therefore necessary to draw the lessons in terms of improving and investing in public health and making it truly universal. Uh, Ensuring safe and healthy working conditions. Medicine. Care arrangements for the elderly. Yeah. Services for and the protection of children. Modernizing education to ensure its sustainability and universality. Employment security. Reducing social and economic inequalities. Given that this virus is here to stay and that it is likely, unfortunately, that there will be other virus or other non-viral disasters, it is fundamental to draw such lessons and to construct our future with the necessary national legislative, regulatory and funding mechanisms in one hand, of course, but also with the European Social Charter in the other. The Charter is a unique instrument at European level. It is alive and well and has potential to continue developing and growing. The Charter should be the lighthouse guiding the development of a new or renewed social contract fit for the 21st century, which many world leaders and reputed personalities now demand. And the third aspect I would like to touch upon is the Charter and its procedures are key governance instruments for member states to be best informed and equipped to take the best possible decisions in all areas which are covered by the Charter and relevant for responding to pandemic, sanitary or other general crisis. Each state owes the best possible governance arrangements to its people and to all persons within its, its jurisdiction. Anything short of embracing the best instruments of democratic governance is unacceptable and amounts to government or legislators failing people. It is therefore necessary to step up efforts to strengthen commitment to the Charter and strongly argue in favor of member states that have not yet done so, ratifying the revised Charter, accepting more provisions, preferably all, and accepting the collective complaints procedure, as Madame Rurka said. In particular, the collective complaints procedure is not only a good governance tool for member states, but also a good democratic tool giving the fundamental role of social partners and civil society at large in identifying the issues that require special attention and scrutiny. In the same vein, and for many reasons, the Council of Europe, alongside member states that are also members of the European Union, should put on the table the question of accession by the EU to the European Social Charter. To sum up, I propose urgent and vigorous action. First, to ensure that the European Social Charter and the case law and findings of the European Committee of Social Rights is fully relied upon as a key governance tool for responding to the current crisis and that it inspires changes and a new social contract that will allow for improved risk management and sustainability after the emergency is over. And second, to strongly encourage member states that have not yet done so to ratify the revised charter, to accept more provisions and to accept the collective complaints procedure. Lastly, given, given the welcome forward-looking reflection that you have proposed under the Greek chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers, dear Minister, I would like to add a very final suggestion. But if a second turn of very short intervention is, is foreseen, I might defer such a vote for a next half a minute intervention. Thank you for your attention.
Well, you, you have also uh, said we are going to have a second round, but I think that uh, if you have uh, something uh, to propose, uh, we'll do it now so we can comment or, or somebody else can comment on that, uh, uh, if you please. Thank, thank you, thank you. So uh, I would like to say that the, the, the current crisis has already had a significant impact on the well-being and the lives of people. I dare say of everyone in our societies. There has been and there continues to be so much suffering and so much loss that people, I mean communities and also millions of individuals, will have to be given the opportunity to engage with, understand and mourn their losses and their suffering. People will need to come to terms with all this. If people's needs are not satisfied, and there is no opportunity to rebuild trust, the damage will persist and the ripples will destabilize communities and countries and possibly threaten social and democratic sustainability. In order to mitigate these risks, I think that there will be a need for some form of social dialogue to enable reconciliation after COVID-19. I'm thinking, for example, of a sort of a ad hoc public platform or forum and the Council of Europe could and should play, in my humble view, a part in such a reconciliation process and organized social dialogue. And that's all. Thank you again. Well, I find it a very interesting idea, indeed, uh, the, the social dialogue uh, uh, in order to build trust and to deal with reconciliation. Uh, thank you very much for your intervention. And I would like now to come to the President of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture and Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, the well-known to us uh, CPT. Uh, dear uh, Mr. Gnatowski, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Minister Vervitsiotis, uh, the Chair, Secretary General, uh, President of the Parliamentary Assembly, President of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, Commissioner for Human Rights, Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, let me start by thanking the Greek chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe for organizing this important event and for taking up the topic of human rights protection in the context of a pandemic as their priority. I will take this opportunity to make a few remarks regarding the approach that uh, should be taken by the Council of Europe and its member states, in my view, in response to this uh, crisis, both generally and also more concretely in the light of the work of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture, the, the CPT. At the most general level, I think that the ongoing crisis demonstrated the clear need to put human rights first in each decision by the authorities of every country in the context of the pandemic and beyond. Every decision taken should be based on a thorough assessment of its concrete implications for human rights of all persons concerned. Further, the implementation of such decisions can only be human rights compliant if it is properly mainstreamed at all levels, from top to bottom. In short, human rights should become a part of everyday thinking for all officials. Any measures taken in response to the pandemic must stem from the positive obligation of states to protect the right to life and respect other fundamental rights and freedoms, first and foremost, the prohibition of ill treatment. Let us keep in mind the position reiterated by the European Court of Human Rights time and again, Articles 2 and 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, enshrine the basic values of the democratic societies making up the Council of Europe. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the relevance of interconnection between these basic values by adding another perspective to it. Thus, problems that have given rise to concerns related to Article 3, such as prison overcrowding and lack of the necessary health care for prisoners in the context of the pandemic became truly deadly, potentially amounting to violation of Article 2. From the CPT's perspective, the pandemic also hit the hardest in those places of deprivation of liberty where the previous recommendations made by the committee had not been implemented. This relates to the entire spectrum of the CPT's broad mandate from prisons to social care homes, from psychiatric hospitals to immigration detention centers. Let me give you the example of the situation of prisoners. 
In a sense, the committee is now witness to a pandemic crisis, which is taking place inside a pre-existing criminal justice crisis. As the responses from member states to the CPT's request for information regarding their action to protect detained people during the pandemic have shown, action is only now being taken in crisis mode on some issues that have been the subject of CPT recommendations for very many years. This could be illustrated by referring to three particular principles from the CPT statement of principles relating to the treatment of persons deprived of their liberty in the context of the coronavirus disease pandemic, which we issued back in March this year. In that document, principle five reads, as close personal contact encourages the spread of the virus, concerted efforts should be made by all relevant authorities to resort to alternatives to deprivation of liberty. Such an approach is imperative in particular in situations of overcrowding. Further, and I emphasize here, authorities should make greater use of alternatives to pretrial detention, to commutation of sentences, early release, and probation. End of quote. While welcoming the measures that have been taken in many member states to release low risk prisoners and reduce the use of detention, these are policies which, in the interest of the prevention of ill treatment, should remain, so to say, central planks of any healthy criminal justice policy. The action of governments to reduce overcrowding in response to the pandemic also made it clear that some of their previous arguments that they could not decongest prisons were not always fully sincere. Our principle uh, six from the March statement reads, as regards the provision of health care, special attention will be required to the specific needs of detained persons with particular regard to vulnerable groups and or at-risk groups, such as older persons and persons with pre-existing medical conditions. This includes inter alia screening for COVID-19 and pathways to intensive care as required. In this respect, I must say that comprehensive medical screening on admission, as well as providing rapid pathways for specialist care, must become a sine qua non of healthcare provision in places of detention. This is also an indispensable means of reducing the risk of ill treatment through the accurate recording and proper reporting of injuries on arrival. These are by far not the only critical issues that need to be factored in when discussing the response to the COVID-19 crisis. As mentioned in our March statement, principle seven, while it is legitimate and reasonable to suspend non-essential activities, the fundamental rights of detained persons during the pandemic must be fully respected. And this includes in particular adequate personal hygiene and daily access to open air, and then any restrictions on contact with the outside world should be compensated by increased access to alternative means of communication. In its next annual report, as well as outlining our experience of protecting the rights of detained persons during the pandemic, the CPT will reflect on the need for there to be, as a part of our common European values, a threshold of decency on these matters that is respected in places of detention throughout the Council of Europe space. To sum up, Chair, while state of emergency must, of course, not become the norm, some of the positive responses of member states to the COVID-19 pandemic, such as taking effective measures against prison overcrowding, make one think of the old saying, necessity is the mother of invention. In this respect, the future Athens Declaration holds out the promise of embedding some of the innovations that have been introduced recently as permanent elements of policies of Council of Europe member states as regards the deprivation of liberty in various contexts, including in the context of criminal justice. I thank you very much for your attention. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, President. Uh, I want to inform you that uh, on my backdrop, there is a, a strong uh, a spring uh, storm that is passing by. So we have extreme noise and a lot of, a lot of rain. And um, well, thank you for your comments. And I would like to, to go on to uh, Mrs. Uh, Maruda, the Chair for European Commission Against uh, Racism and Intolerance, uh, the Chair of ECRI. Ms. Maruda. 
Thank you uh, very much, Minister and the Greek Presidency, for the initiative, this extremely important exchange of views and the opportunity for ECRI to take part in what we understand is only the beginning of the process for the adoption of the Athens Declaration. Now, our contribution to this dialogue, to this exchange of views, um, uh, and to the Athens Declaration would be to include uh, uh, the following principles. And I will immediately start with those and then say a few words on each one. So the first would be um, the principles of complementarity and cooperation. Um, the second, at least in conveying what we see as a very strong and common message to respect for human rights, democracy and the rule of law during and after the pandemic. Secondly, the principle of inclusiveness. When it comes to measures taken uh, by governments, uh, either to deal with the public health uh, emergency or with the consequences, mostly economic consequences of this uh, crisis. Thirdly, empowerment. Empowerment for equality bodies. They need to be independent and effective and for the civil society. And last but not least, I will have to refer to the principle of flexibility that we all need to show as monitoring bodies of the Council of Europe to adapt to this strange period and these strange circumstances in our monitoring work. So when it comes to complementarity and cooperation, uh, this is not only within the Council of Europe, but also with other bodies such as FRA and ODIR of the OSCE. Uh, and we have started this cooperation as ECRI with a joint statement on the 21st of March, it was the day against racism and discrimination. And uh, we continued with this cooperation uh, throughout this period, and we think this is important, but also within the Council of Europe. Cooperation with all monitoring bodies, we have a complementary work. And it's very important to make sure that this work uh, is um, even more uh, reinforced in this period. And I am, of course, talking to two monitoring for two monitoring bodies that are not taking part in this particular exchange of views, but I'm pretty sure they will be invited for the next round of exchange of views. And it's uh, the two bodies that are part of the anti-discrimination unit of the Council of Europe, uh, the advisory group of the Framework Convention on National Minorities, and uh, of the Charter of regional and minority languages. Uh, secondly, cooperation with the court, the European Court for Human Rights. Already when uh, President Sicilianos uh, was there at the last plenary we had in ECRI in December 2019, uh, we mentioned the importance in the work and the cooperation between the court and monitoring bodies um, such as ECRI uh, for um, the work on um, violations of the European Convention of Human Rights, but also prevention, because this is also extremely important for us. Cooperation also with the European Committee of Social Rights, especially in this period. Um, we will also like to mention our cooperation as ECRI in the future. We were supposed to have this meeting in April, but it was po postponed for September with the Parliamentary Assembly on hate speech targeting particularly vulnerable groups such as Roma migrants and LGBTI persons. And our work um, on the Charter of European Political Parties for a Non-Racist Society, we, are, we have uh, decided on the 25th anniversary of ECRI to update and to work with PACE on this charter. We consider this is extremely important, especially in this period. Now, uh, as you know, our monitoring bodies and ECRI did, never actually stopped working. Uh, we did adopt very early this year our annual report and presented it to the Committee of Ministers. And uh, a few days ago, as Bureau, uh, we published a statement on what are the basic uh, three groups of concern for ECRI that have been particularly affected, either due to extensive restrictions or due to their inherent vulnerability, and I'm talking about Roma migrants and LGBTI persons. We have underlined as Bureau in our statement that Roma and migrants already face poverty, marginalization and exclusion, whilst often experience intersexual discrimination. And through our work, we have uh, observed that these hardships are only deepening with the COVID-19 pandemic and the exclusion, of the exclusion of the most vulnerable people will further intensify if governments do not take action to meet their specific needs and to counter anti-Roma and anti-migrant hate speech and violence as a matter of urgency. 
We also consider that the current crisis is a little test for Council of Europe member states to protect human rights of LGBTI persons, both in public and at home, online and offline. When we presented uh, um, our annual report um, late February at the Committee of Ministers, we underlined that xenophobic ultranationalism and racist hatred in Europe continued to undermine the action taken or planned by governments and other partners to make equality for all a reality, to present diversity as a major strength and to develop more inclusive societies. In a number of countries, these trends were further inflamed by politicians or public figures in general who wish to steer resentment against specific groups. We as ECRI um, have a scene that what we witness in the US these days is a worrying trend that we have also observed in our monitoring work in Europe. Because people who are, feel that they are left behind by an economic and social squeeze in recent years saw equality for all as a threat to their already shrinking resources and perceived the inclusion of marginalized groups, such as migrants or Roma, as further unwanted competition. I am afraid this feeling will only grow with the economic crisis that is coming unless uh, inclusiveness becomes the norm. Empowering Equality bodies and civil society is extremely important and as ECRI we call on states to take due account of our general policy recommendations and to cooperate with equality bodies and civil society organizations when developing, implementing and evaluating the responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Public policies designed to address the challenges posed by the pandemic and future economic consequences should not be based solely on public health and economic considerations, but should also rely on strong human rights considerations. When it comes to flexibility, with ECRI at the Bureau in March, we already uh, adopted uh, our reports in, with a, an extraordinary written procedure for the first time. And these reports on Albania and Austria were published yesterday. And I think this is particularly important and we have as monitoring bodies to show this flexibility. And we are having our plenary um, in June, end of June, virtual. Uh, so this again is very new and very important um, to mention. Uh, we have also had a number of meetings and two working groups uh, that were planned um, on the on our future work, the working group on antisemitism and the working group on uh, fight against on um, hate against Muslims, and uh, we have had uh, we have adopted a general policy recommendation 15, 16 years ago. But now we think it's high time to work again on these general policy recommendations and see where we are. And our next general policy recommendation will be on LGBTI, and we will soon start our work on that. In our monitoring, what we are doing is more and more, and this you can see in our last reports, work on good practices, best practices, not only policies of the central government, but also of the local authorities, and we consider this very important. And um, because of the CDADI, which is the new steering group on anti-discrimination of the Committee of Ministers, launching of a survey, we are, uh, as ECRI, also having an input on this survey on what are the best practices of the different member states in dealing with the pandemic. And this survey will appear in September. Um, now, our recommendations at this stage and on ways to move forward. What we would, would like to mention is, one, support the adoption or improvement of national policies against racism and intolerance, ensure an inclusive and fair recovery for all after this pandemic, ensure that funding programs, reopening of the economy, restructuring and improving access to basic services, included the new recovery instrument of the European Union, include measures that address the specific situation on employment benefits, access to health education and decent accommodation or work of all those marginalized. It, this is central to assess the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on marginalized groups and to design tailored responses.
And I would like to end with a final recommendation that governments should adopt a clear human rights based approach at all times and even more so in times of crisis. And uh, this means that in the COVID-19 task forces or advisory boards that have already been set up by governments, we think that they must include specialists in human rights and particularly in the fields of equality and non-discrimination. Thank you very much. Well, well, we thank you. We thank you as well, Pio uh, Maria. I think that you have added uh, specific points in our discussion. I point out flexibility, which is uh, something that uh, definitely needs to be uh, highlighted in uh, in any uh, intervention, uh, because w one uh, uh, one rule in this time shouldn't be so strict, and everybody should adapt. And, uh, and, uh, on, their, on their own needs. Uh, and I will pass now the floor to George Nicolaidis, uh, the chairperson of the Lanzarote Committee, uh, the Convention of Protection of Children Against Sexual Exploitation and Sexual Abuse. Dear George. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, this uh, invitation of our committee to uh, participate in this event as well as for your overall good efforts in uh, highlighting the issue of human rights in the COVID uh, uh, pandemic era. Um, uh, for our perspective, uh, as societies fight COVID-19, uh, they also have to face the devastating potential impact uh, the pandemic and the measures to address it might have on children. Uh, this uh, might unfold in uh, uh, several dimensions, one of which is the impact on children's uh, mental health uh, in terms of the fear they experience, in terms of their uh, disruption of social life, in terms of their stopping education and social contacts and interactions, in terms also of the uh, visible uh, economic crisis that uh, uh, is uh, seems to be emerging in the directly foreseeable time that puts pressures on families, children and adolescents. Uh, in that sense, uh, many international organizations have been recognizing that the impact on children, especially on mental health of children of this current crisis, should be one priority area for all model states. And this is acknowledged not only by, by organizations such as WHO or UNICEF, but also from organizations such as the World Economic Forum and others. Apart from that, there is the dimension of children's exposure to domestic abuse, and that's more uh, pertinent to our uh, job uh, as monitoring body of Council of Europe. We know that hundreds of thousands of children have been sheltered in place. We also know that the vast majority of perpetrators in incidents of, uh, of violence against children are children's own parents or caregivers. So the situation was the following. We had uh, hundreds of thousands of children being locked up with their own perpetrators, which might have the opportunity, given the circumstance, of expanding the zone of control over their victims 24-7. Uh, that uh, was uh, the reason uh, for me and the vice chair of the committee publishing a statement at early April, uh, highlighting the importance of the issue to all parties of Council of Europe and asking from all parties to take specific initiatives to enhance child protection during the time of the lockdown. Uh, we also uh, expect and anecdotal reports from various part, par countries and parties of Council of Europe verify that, that in the uh, time in which um, uh, in the time in which uh, countries uh, more and more uh, lift the lockdown measures, we will have more and more disclosures by children that will have the opportunity of disclosing some place somewhere, uh, while on the contrary, on the previous time of the lockdown, they had not this, this opportunity to do so. Uh, in, our, uh, in that sense, as we conclude our declaration, as societies, as we fight the COVID-19 pandemic, we should remember that violence against children is another pandemic that makes millions of victims every year. 
and we shouldn't forget that. We also have underlined the issue of extremely vulnerable children, such as children in institutional residential care facilities, children with disabilities, children placed in other out-of-home placement, uh, uh, placement, in makeshift refugee camps, or they were deprived of their liberties. These children are additionally vulnerable in the situation of being perpetrated uh, in terms of domestic uh, violence and abuse of their own rights. One last dimension of uh, the uh, one one last dimension of uh, the situation is that in virtue of the shelter in place measures applied in uh, most of the countries throughout Europe and globally, uh, children, especially adolescents, had to rely on information and communication technologies to sustain education, their social interaction, leisure. And we know that that exposes them to running the risk of being sexually perpetrated, exploited, victimized uh, more and more frequently. Uh, therefore, we believe that efforts should be made in enhancing the uh, services that offer support to children that information for helplines and other resources for asking for help should be made available to children themselves, but also families, parents, and caregivers should be supported in being able to handle of difficulties uh, of uh, their children's potential mental health issues. Uh, last but not least, we have asked all parties to um, uh, send inform us about initiatives they have uh, taken throughout the lockdown area, and we have received several very interesting good practices that we are planning to be able to discuss in our forthcoming mid-June online plenary meeting in order to come up with some more comprehensive image of uh, good practices that work or uh, common errors that should be avoided. Uh, in concluding my intervention, I would like to just sum up uh, that our own contribution to the issue of human rights can be uh, uh, made uh, sense in a very simple uh, three principle uh, uh, way. The first one is that our problems as societies that were before the COVID epidemic are still there. And we should not forget that we have also to combat them as well. And in that sense, what was said by one previous speaker is fully right, that those rights that were not fully realized before the pandemic, now we face the consequences as we do, uh, for instance, in big institutions for the elderly. The second element would be that although we are societies that are technology driven, there are simple social technologies that are effective, that could save thousands of lives, such as uh, institutionalization or uh, providing services for children victims of violence and sexual exploitation and abuse. And the third is that children are society's ultimate social capital and we shouldn't spare investment and resources because actually they are the future of our societies. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, George. Uh, I think that uh... Uh, we are waiting, everybody will wait to hear from you the good practices that you're going to highlight and uh, especially your personal medical experience and non-legalistic background uh, give us an, another angle uh, to this issue. Uh, and now I come to the former president of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, Mr. Alexandros Linos Sicilianos, uh, who has actually stepped down the day that uh, the Greek uh, chairmanship uh, took over. So. Uh, dear Linus, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Ministre. Merci infiniment pour uh, cette invitation et d'avoir bien voulu m'associer à cet exercice extrêmement uh, intéressant. Uh, beaucoup a été dit et prendre, uh, uh, disons, la parole à la fin ou presque de notre discussion n'est pas facile. Je voudrais néanmoins axer mon propos sur la notion de l'action face à la pandémie. Action positive des États, limite à cette action et caractère collectif de l'action. Alors l'action face à la pandémie, à mon sens, c'est la deux dimensions qui ont émergé à travers notre débat. 
et tout d'abord, bien évidemment, l'obligation positive pour protéger la santé et la vie. Ce n'est pas facile, c'est facile à dire, c'est extrêmement difficile à réaliser. Et je pense que le président Palmisano a dit beaucoup de choses intéressantes là-dessus, notamment sur les implications sous l'angle de la charte sociale. Mais il y a aussi un autre élément de cette action face à la pandémie, à savoir éviter l'accroissement des inégalités. Plusieurs orateurs qui m'ont précédé ont insisté sur le fait que la crise affecte, affecte notamment les plus vulnérables, les laissés pour compte, les groupes vulnérables, les demandeurs d'asile, les détenus, les groupes ethniques, les enfants, les Roms, les personnes handicapées, les chômeurs. Et, et bien évidemment, nous avons entendu que la charte sociale, une fois de plus, constitue un, un outil à prendre en considération, tout comme euh, d'autres instruments euh, du Conseil de l'Europe. Donc, ce deuxième axe de l'action de l'État devrait porter, à mon sens, sur euh, l'adoucissement des effets négatifs euh, de la crise. Non seulement donc l'obligation positive de protéger la vie et la santé, mais d'adoucir les effets négatifs de la crise sur euh, les plus euh, vulnérables, sur les laissés pour le troisième axe qui, pour l'instant, n'a pas été mis en évidence, ou pas suffisamment en tout cas, c'est celui de voir la pandémie non pas comme un, euh, un, un mal seulement, mais aussi comme une opportunité, comme une occasion pour moderniser l'État, euh, une occasion pour moderniser le fonctionnement de la justice. Nous avons fait beaucoup ici à la Cour pour moderniser nos propres euh, méthodes de travail. Et il y a eu, sous la présidence française, il y a quelques mois, une euh, conférence ministérielle qui nous invitait au mois de novembre dernier, et qui nous invitait à, à, à moderniser le fonctionnement de la justice. Donc, euh, euh, moderniser à travers le recours au numérique et pourrait être aussi un troisième axe de, de, de l'action positive de l'État, moderniser l'initiation également. Les limites à l'action. Le président de la Cour, M. Spano, a mentionné la quintessence, je dirais le, le noyau des principes élaborés par la Cour en la matière, l'égalité, proportionnalité, nécessité. Qui dit l'égalité dit aussi qualité de la loi, qui dit proportionnalité et nécessité dit aussi pertinence. Et Mme Maroud a, a mentionné le recours à des experts, y compris des experts aux droits de l'homme, l'impact sur les droits de l'homme. La Commission consultative nationale française et son homologue grec ont fait beaucoup en la matière, ont émis un certain nombre d'avis euh, concernant l'impact concret des mesures prises euh, par euh, les autorités et les autorités françaises et grecques euh, respectives. Et qui dit pertinence dit aussi suivi adaptation continue des mesures et contrôle. Contrôle parlementaire, bien évidemment, les présidents d'EMS et Boukikio l'ont soutenu, l'ont mis en évidence, mais aussi contrôle juridictionnel. Notre réseau, le, le réseau que notre cours a établi, le réseau des cours suprêmes, a recensé un grand nombre d'arrêts et décisions qui ont été pris par les juridictions européennes, le Conseil d'État grec, la Cour de cassation française qui s'est prononcée sur les ordonnances du 25 mars 2020, le Conseil constitutionnel français, la Cour constitutionnelle allemande qui a déclaré inconstitutionnelle certaines mesures face au Covid, idem pour ce qui est de la Cour constitutionnelle de la Bosnie-Herzégovine, etc. Donc, donc, le contrôle juridictionnel est quelque chose de très important, ainsi qu'il ressort de cette étude, je vous assure, extrêmement intéressante, qui est effectuée au sein de notre réseau des cours suprêmes. Et puis après, ce contrôle doit se faire pendant la crise, mais il doit se faire, et cela a été dit et souligné, après la crise, pendant la période de, de sortie de la crise, pendant la période de transition, de levée des mesures et pendant la période de retour à la, à, à la normalité. Enfin, troisième élément, je termine par là, Monsieur le ministre, l'action doit être collective. On l'a dit et répété, il doit y avoir des synergies, des synergies multiples, des synergies au niveau national, bien sûr, au sein du gouvernement en, en, avec une coordination des différents ministères, parmi les pouvoirs de l'État et des synergies également entre le gouvernement central et les pouvoirs locaux. Le président du Congrès l'a rappelé à juste titre. Et puis après, des synergies au niveau international, au sein du Conseil de l'Europe, parmi les organes intergouvernementaux et les organes d'experts, entre la Cour 
et les organes de monitorage, etc., etc. Donc, des synergies au sein de notre organisation, des synergies également entre le Conseil de l'Europe, l'Union européenne, l'OSCE, les organisations régionales donc, euh, en Europe et le question les institutions du système des Nations unies. Voilà donc comment je verrai moi-même... Euh, en tout cas, quelques suggestions euh, au sujet des points qui devraient, à mon sens, se figurer euh, dans la déclaration d'Athènes euh, qui sera adoptée sur votre responsabilité. Je euh, voudrais saisir cette occasion pour vous féliciter une fois de plus pour cette initiative particulièrement pertinente. Merci beaucoup. Et merci, et cher Linos. Euh, évidemment, l'occasion pour... Euh modernisement des modes de travail, ce que nous faisons maintenant, euh, une téléconférence comme ça avec tous euh, dans, dans le même cadre. Euh, alors, je passe, le floor de, je, je passe la parole à Madame Bakoyanis. Last not, but not least, uh, Mrs. Bakoyanis, uh, your vast political experience, uh, I think uh, you can... Uh, at the end of uh, this uh, circle, uh, highlight things that uh, you definitely see them in a different angle that uh, than we see. You can spot, you know, the dark areas that you Thank haven't you. we haven't highlighted yet. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. On behalf of my colleagues at the Greek delegation at Pace, it's a great pleasure to see you all and exchange views and opinions on the Greek presidency's priorities. I would like to thank Minister Miltiadis Varvitsiotis for this initiative as the Greek presidency of the Council of Europe commences. I think we have an overview of what our presidency will be focusing on and our main priorities and the reasoning behind them. I believe these past few months have brought about fundamental changes in the way we do things as people, as societies, as nations, and as Council of Europe members. And although issues such as technology, human rights, public health, and modern challenges, e-governance and the democracy of 280 characters, also known as Twitter democracy, all of them existed prior to the pandemic, and they sport debates among experts, nonetheless, they were not placed in a context, in a real-life, real-time paradigm. The COVID-19 pandemic brought an abrupt change to all, to all of that. Within roughly a month, we had to learn a new and change the way we travel, how we buy things, how we touch things and one another, how we socialize, how we govern, and how we are governed. It highlighted the importance of scientific data, of cooperation between local and international institutions, the need for transparency and trust in our political system. Without a doubt, COVID-19 brought a number of challenges, as already mentioned, for our economies, our democracies, and our multilateral relations. But as the, the optimist I consider myself to be, I truly believe it also brought opportunities. To draw from, the Greece, from Greece's experience, the past few months, so a huge leap in the digitalization of public and private services, one that many believed would take many years to actually come to fruition. This includes teleworking, digitalization of local public and tax services, teleeducation, and so forth. It led to the strengthening of institutions like government and parliament, where close to our operation was never abandoned, our parliament, as um, uh, Vaviciotti, Mr. Vaviciotti already said, remained open, following health security protocols, but all executive acts in the context of state emergency met parliamentary scrutiny and approval. This, in turn, restored the trust of our citizens in their government and democracy as one functioning towards their best interests. Of course, I acknowledge this was not the case everywhere. And there are examples where the pandemic created a democracy vacuum, where concrete issues regarding public health, human rights, trust, and transparency arose. There were difficult dilemmas in place. 
there was need for emergency measures that would impact freedoms and citizens' rights in order to control pandemic, a virus with such a high rate of transmission, social distancing, restriction of movement, lockdown of places was necessary. An overburdened, excluded health system underlined the need for public-private cooperation while it tested to the limits the endurance of our medical staff. And of course, in a plethora of other issues, the were functioning of democratic institutions came into question and in some countries, unfortunately, to a standstill. All the above challenges can be seen only as such simply challenges for us to overcome and set aside. Or they can also be seen as opportunities to learn, to adjust, to improve, and to ameliorate our way of doing things. What will be tested here is our resilience, our ability to adjust without sacrificing the principles that define us, rule of law, respect of human rights, and life, trust, and in democracy. Progress and not regret. I'm proud to say that the Council of Europe was a bright example during this crisis. In a matter of a month, all our physical meetings turned to virtual through video conferencing and our work never stopped. A Council of Europe toolbox was prepared with the contribution of many of you, like Face President Rick Dems, offering guidance, guidelines and standards for all member states. And this was invaluable to get us through the recent month and to design the next day. But now we are preparing for two things. First of all, we are preparing for the Athens Declaration. And the Athens Declaration, I think, should be one very, very important message from the Council of Europe to the whole world. With all your experience together, we will be able in this declaration to write down the main messages which we got out of uh, and add up the experience all of you have after the COVID-19 crisis and how we will deal with the next day. And this next day is what the Greek presidency is about. We have to think about the extra mile, thinking forward to what will come in the future and how we are preparing for it, not just in the context of yesterday, but in the context of tomorrow, because there be, will be an unknown territory for us to discover. We need a sincere discussion on our principles and our values and how they meet the needs during an ever-changing society, often in crisis and emergency. How the right to privacy meets the need to track and trace. Austria today just launched the Stop Corona Tracing application. How freedom of movement meets the need for social distancing. And, of, and how the often labeled bureaucratic democratic institutions need to respond to fast changing and demanding situations. To sum up, we have an opportunity to set the pace, the standards and the bar high for principles such as democracy, rule of law and human rights in a world that is changing constantly and in some cases with defiance to the above mentioned principles. We can learn from today, learn from the pandemic, from the deficiencies and the weaknesses that surfaced, but also from the strengths and good practices that emerged and build a toolbox, not just for today, not just for tomorrow, but for the many years to come. And not just for us, but, uh, but, the, uh, but not only for the members of the Council, but for all. It's a big challenge for the Greek presidency, and I wish all of us every success. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dora. I think that uh, you highlighted uh, different aspects and questions that uh, have to be answered. And I know that uh, uh, both you and your team, you always raise the bar high. And uh, we are going to, to, to keep up this uh, nice uh, uh, struggle in order to raise the, the, uh, the bar 
as high as we can in order to grab this opportunity, as you rightly mentioned. Well, uh, I thank you all for your interventions. I would like, uh, before closing, to ask whether there is uh, any need for a second round of interventions. Uh, if there is anybody who would like to take the floor, uh, please, please step up. Um, well, uh, either either we have tackled all the issues in a proper way, or we uh, the the difficulties and the difficulties of a teleconference that's lasting more than a couple of hours is. Uh, I know that it's it's tiring. It's never be and it will never be the same. A teleconference like a a real uh, conference, a vivid exchange of views. Um, but I think that uh, what we have managed today is to put on the table uh, with uh, your substantive intervention and comments to put on the table all the major issues that have to be tackled. Uh, from next week in the Committee of Ministers, with the help of uh, the General Secretary, we are going to, uh, to, start, um, uh, to start dealing with these questions and uh, to start formulating our uh, first proposal. Um, I would like to tell you that after a discussion I had with the Prime Minister of Greece uh, this morning, we, we want also to, apart from uh, uh, going on towards the 4th of November, we would like to call also for a conference, a forum. Uh, Dora has proposed that in a teleconference we had a couple of days ago, uh, to have a forum, a scientific forum, on the issues that we are going to tackle earlier before the uh, November conference, and hopefully we are going to do it uh, uh, in a way that with a physical presence uh, sometime in, in uh, mid-September, October, depending also on how the Parliamentary Assembly schedule is going to be uh, formulated. And uh, we are going to have also the vice president of the Greek government leading this um, uh, very well-known judge, uh, Mr. Pikramenos, leading uh, uh, this uh, initiative. Uh, I would like also to mention that uh, on June 17th, uh, at the same time, we are going to have another meeting uh, with the uh, other committees, uh, with the chairs of the other committees of the Council of Europe, because within this framework, it, it was impossible to have everybody. So I uh, will welcome definitely Madam Secretary General, but any of you who would like to join us in this uh, second round of discussion. And uh, uh, I think that uh, we have already, uh, we have uh, already uh, tackled a lot of issues. Uh, I would like to thank you all for participating. Uh, I will let you know that the weather now in Athens is uh, <laughs> again sunny. Uh, you know, a, sto a storm, a heavy storm comes and passes by and the sun uh, comes back. So uh, this is the way that we want to see also this storm that uh, came into our lives and changed a lot. But uh, as you have rightly mentioned, uh, we haven't solved all the issues before in order not only to have the COVID-19 and the pandemic issues that arose from this uh, situation to deal with, but we have to do also our proper work in defending uh, human rights, in defending democracy, in defending rule of law. And this is a battle that is a constant battle towards, uh, uh, towards uh, uh, the end, which is to live in a, a continent that the rule of law, democracy, and human rights prevail. Thank you very much for your participation, and thank you very much for your patience.